Hello everyone, welcome back to another reviews video tutorial. My name is Juan and today I'm going to teach you how to estimate arch models in eViews. This is a topic that a lot of people ask me about, so here I took the time to make this video. I hope you find it useful and that it helps to clarify your doubts that you had about this topic. I want to let you know that there is a link in the description where you can download the data to replicate the content and also in that page you will be able to find a link where you can buy the eViews work file with all the results in case you are interested in that and also will include the slides of this video. So let's begin then with ARCH models. ARCH stands for Autoregressive Conditional Heteroscedasticity. This model was introduced by Engel in 1982 in his paper entitled Autoregressive Conditional Heteroscedasticity with Estimates of the Variance of United Kingdom Inflation. The model was later expanded in 1986 by Lev when he introduced Karch models. So, so far we have focused on modeling the mean of the dependent variable. So in other words, we were trying to predict what is the value of, for example, GDP in the next quarter or inflation or interest rates. However, in this lecture, we are not going to focus on the mean, we're going to focus on the variance. So traditional econometrics models assume that the variance of the disturbance term is constant over time. Yet, many economic time series face periods of higher volatility than usual, violating the homoscedasticity assumption. Therefore, asset holders and financial institutions may be interested in estimating not only the returns, but also the variance of the assets. So we'll talk a little bit about volatility clustering. For today's example, I have Toronto stock exchange returns, and here is the graph where it starts in 2016, goes to the present, 2021. This is daily data. And you can see that the returns, uh, the volatility has been pretty stable over time. However, there's been a big gap in here. There's been a big issue here in the beginning of 2020 with COVID. And we've seen that the volatility has increased uh, in a significant way. And it has remained quite volatile over this period. So when we are talking about volatility clustering, um, this is to mention that it's a common effect in equity markets and its periods of small volatility are followed uh, by small volatility periods. However, when there is a period of higher volatility, then those periods are followed by higher volatility periods as well. Moving to this next slide, you can see I have included on one axis, I have included the returns with the volatility here increasing in the 2020. And this is the graph of the um, exchange, of the TSX exchange. And you can see that it has been in an increasing trend. However, in 2020, there has been a big uh, drop. And that's the reason why volatility had increased. Consequently, assuming that the variance is constant over time might not be appropriate and we might not be incorporating all the volatility that is in this variable. So let's move to talk about some considerations of ARCH. The concept ARCH refers to series with volatility changing over time. That's why we're talking about heteroscedasticity. And it's conditional to previous lags autocorrelation. That's why we're talking about autoregressive conditional. So it's basically, we're saying it's not constant over time, the variance. And that variance is going to be conditional. Yes, it's going to be changing depending on what happened in the previous, in the previous lags, yes, in the recent past. So volatility models are performed over stationary time series, we're talking about the mean, but with a non-constant variance. So when modeling ARCH, the variance depends on past squared innovations. So we previously learned how to estimate the mean of a univariate time series with ARIMA models. So now we will verify if the model shows periods of higher volatility by checking the existence of ARCH effects. Let's move into the formalities of ARCH models. This first equation is the mean equation. I have my variable yt, which is going to be explained by a constant, and the lag value of itself, and an error term. So this is an autoregressive model. Be aware that the mean, you can estimate it also with moving average um, components. You can estimate an ARMA model. So whatever the type of specification that you do will be fine. As long as you, all we need to do is to estimate, find an appropriate model to estimate the mean. The second equation corresponds to the error, which is going to be conditional to the previous information. And it's following a normal distribution with a zero mean. And here in the HT, I have the variance is going to depend on time. And this H stands for heteroscedasticity. 
So some people put here the, the sigma square, some other um, like textbooks and the paper of a Granger uh, do the H. So that's why I have written an H in here. So what is this H? What is uh, this variance going to be depending on? Well, this variance depends basically on, on a constant and the previous uh, square residual errors. So what are we trying to say in here? So basically all we are saying with this type of specification is that the variance, the volatility of the variance is going to be basically depending on what happened in the previous, in the recent past. And this model has to satisfy a couple of conditions. So the first thing of all is that the alpha zero and all the other alphas as well, alpha one, alpha two, uh, until alpha n, have to be bigger than zero. And this is to guarantee a positive variance. The second thing that we have to ensure is that the sum of all the alphas, so alpha one until alpha n, um, the sum doesn't exceed one. And the reason that we need that to be true is so the model always returns to the same mean and it doesn't have an explosive result. And finally, what we need to ask is that all the alphas, so alpha one um, has to be bigger than alpha two and has to be bigger than alpha three and has to be bigger than alpha n. So basically we are going to be estimating an arch model with potentially more than one lag. Yes, that's why there's a P in here. We have to determine how many arch um, components we are including in our variance model. But what we need to verify is that the first lag is going to be bigger than the second lag and is going to be bigger than the third lag, uh, bigger than the N lag. And the reason for this is because the recent past has more influence than older lags. What we are saying basically with this um, statement is that what happened yesterday will have more weight than what happened probably three, four, five, six months ago. Okay, so recent information is going to have more, um, it's going to have more weight than very old information. What are the steps to estimate arch models? Well, estimating arch models involves two parts, and each of these parts has two steps. So the first part is the mean equation, where the two steps involving estimating the mean equation are stationarity. Our variable needs to be stationary to estimate the mean equation. And the step number two is, well, finding the appropriate ARIMA model to estimate the mean. We have already seen how to estimate ARIMA models, so I'm not going to focus too much on explaining the whole procedure of ARIMA models. So please feel free to watch my ARIMA models tutorial. And then part two is the variance equation. So once we have estimated the mean, we need to check if there exist arch effects or not. And if it, and if it does exist arch effects, then we have to estimate the arch model. So let's begin with part one. So the first part would be checking for stationarity. You would normally do a graph analysis, correlogram, formal test. But for this example, we're just going to be taking a look at the augmented degree filler results and confirm if our variable is non-stationary in levels. But we have to then check if it's uh, stationary in differences. In eViews, I have here my variable, the Toronto Stock Exchange. I'm going to open this variable and we're going to see the graph. And as you can see, this graph has a positive trend where there's a big drop in the beginning of 2020 due to COVID. And then it uh, goes back to this positive uh, trend. So this clearly is showing a non-stationary variable. We can do the unit root test, the augmented Dicky filler test. And I'm going to include a trend and an intercept because we can see there is a positive trend in this. Um, so the first thing that I would take a look at here is whether including the constant and the trend was appropriate. And we can see that the, at the 5% significance level, we can confirm that included the constant and the trend were appropriate since the p-value is smaller than 0 0.05. And here we have the results of our tests. The results are telling me that we cannot reject my null hypothesis. Because so we're going to be moving now into working with the returns, which the returns of, these, of the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange They'll be stationary. Um, and also that's what we are interested in about determining, yes, the volatility of our returns. So I'm going to generate the variable. I'm gonna type, um, I would like to call it returns. And I'm going to type D log. 
So I'm using differences and log, and that's what it's going to estimate for you the returns of your variable. So I, I have here um, the TSX, which is my variable. So I'm going to hit OK, and I have estimating now my variable returns. We're going to see the graph. And as you can see now, here I have the returns. This is I'm basically applying differences and logs to your variable. And this variable does look uh, that it has uh, as a stationary. However, we can definitely see that the variance is, non -con is not constant. Yeah, so this is what we are interested in modeling. So we're going to go into view, unit root test. We are going to select nothing, no trend or intercept, because it doesn't have a trend. Um, so we're going to hit OK now. And we can see that the returns, yes, once we apply differences and log, my variable is stationary. Since I can I can reject my null hypothesis that my series has a unit root. Consequently, my series is stationary. Um, so that's that's good. So we can now estimate the mean equation. So that's going to be the step number one. So now we are going to move in step number two. We have already checked for stationarity. We have confirmed that my series um, Toronto Stock Exchange is not stationary levels. But when we take a look at the returns, this is applying differences and logs, my series is stationary. And now we will try to identify an ARIMA model. Yes, we will select the order of P and Q. P is for the autoregressive component and Q stands for the moving average components. Looking at the crelogram. So let's go into views now and estimate the mean equation. I'm going to open my variable returns that we have just generated. I'm going to go into view and correlogram. We're going to leave in levels. And as you can see, recall from my tutorials where I um, where I guys show you how to estimate the RIMA models. We have to look at the autocorrelation and the partial autocorrelation to, to be able to identify the orders of P and Q. So all of those uh, bars that are exceeding my confidence bands, those are potential lag orders. However, due to parsimony and just to make it simple, I'm just going to be estimating an ARIMA 1-1 model, but please be aware that you could try with other type of specifications as well. As you can see here, there are a couple bars that are exceeding. However, as I mentioned, I'm interested in estimating um, a parsimonious model. This is not included so many lags, and it's just for this example. So we're going to estimate the mean. So I'm going to type in my command section, ls, which is for least squares. Now the name of my variable, which is returns, I'm going to include a constant, an ar1 term, and then an ma1 term. That's what we have determined by looking at the correlogram. So I'm going to hit enter now, and here I have the results of my model. We can see that the AR component is appropriate, is significant, is st statistically significant, and also my moving average component is statistically significant. Now that we have estimated the equation of our mean, including an AR1 and an MA1 component, we can move into part two, which is going to be checking for the existence of the arch effects. So we're going to conduct the heteroscedasticity test and select the arch option. The null hypothesis of this uh, test is that there is no existing arch effects up to the specified lag. And the alternative hypothesis is that there are arch effects up to the specified lag. As a hint, if the p-value is smaller than 0.05, at the 5% significance level, we reject the null hypothesis and confirm the existence of arch effects. So in views, what we want to do right now is to check whether there exist arch effects or not in my model. I'm going to go then in view, residual diagnostics, and heteroscedasticity tests. We're going to select the arch option, and in the number of lags, we're going to leave for now a one. However, later on, I'm going to show you how we can determine the right amount of lags to include in this model. So I'm going to hit in OK for now. And here we have the test output. And let's go back into the slides so we can do an analysis of these results. In my screen, you can see the heteroscedasticity test output. Uh, here I put that the null hypothesis is that there is no arch effects up to the specified lag order. And as a hint, if the p-value is smaller than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and we confirm the existence of arch effects. 
So that's what we can see in our example. We can see that we are rejecting the null hypothesis and we're confirming that there exist artifacts in my model. Indeed, remember that we included one lag in the test specification and we can see that at this 5% significant level, including that one lag is uh, appropriate. So my heteroscedasticity test is telling me that there are arch effects and also that including one arch, um, one arch effect is appropriate. However, I would like to know if including more arch elements are appropriate in this model. Let's talk about how to determine the arch order. So we have tested for the existence of arch effects up to order one. However, we can include more arch effects in the model. We can review the correlogram of the square residuals and similar to ARIMA models, the partial autocorrelation function will provide some insights about the order. Recall parsimony. We want to keep the model simple, so we don't want to overfit the variance equation, including so many arch components. Finally, recall that the arch effects cannot be negative. So sometimes overfitting the model, this is including so many lags, is going to make all your arch effects negative. So that's definitely not appropriate. It's not a correct specification. So that if that happens to your model where you see that um, there are many arch uh, lags that become negative, you need to start removing lags from your uh, model specification. So this is one of the flaws of arch models is determining the order of arch effects. Some models can incorporate many lags and this can be a bit complicated and even annoying to deal with. So this is when Garch models come to play as Garch models can provide an alternative solution to dealing with arch models with so many lags. However, for this tutorial, we are not going to focus on Garch. We'll proceed now with our arch uh, model estimation. So we're going to do now is we're going to double check what is the correct order of arch components to include in the variance equation. So in views, what we're going to do now is go into view, residual diagnostics and correlogram square residuals. We're going to leave the default lag specification. And here what we can see is that in the autocorrelation, there is some persistence, yes, in the lags. So that's basically why our test, our heteroscedasticity test, was confirming the existence of arch effects. We can see that there is some persistence in this autocorrelation. And also in the partial correlation, we can see that there are some um, significant bars. So that's what's suggesting is possible arch effects. So again, we want to keep a parsimonious model. So I'm not going to be including too many arch effects, but what we can do is definitely um, test perform again the test and include more lags. So I'm going to go into view, um, a residual diagnostics, heteroscedasticity test. And again, you guys can try, you can include more lags. However, for this example, I'm just gonna stick to two. Remember that if you include too many, you're going to be overfitting the model and some of your arch effects are going to become negative and that shouldn't be the case. So let's just for this example, go into using two lags. So using two lags, we can uh, confirm then uh, again, is that both lags are statistically significant. So then uh, doing an arch, an arch uh, of order two is going to be uh, appropriate. So now it's time to estimate our arch two model. So we have a model for the mean equation, which remember we are including a constant. We said that for the mean, we were including an AR1 and an MI1 component. And also we agreed to include two arch effects. So let's go now into views and let's estimate this arch two model. You're going to go into quick estimate equation. And the first thing that I recommend you to do in here is to go into arch. When you go into arch, the following is going to appear. And as you can see, the first box is asking you to write what is your mean equation. And remember that my mean equation was, well, the returns of, of the Toronto Stock Exchange, then was including a constant, the AR1 mod, uh, component and the MA1 component. And the second part, the second box in here is asking me how many arch and garch effects we want to include. For Garch, we're going to put zero since we haven't talked about Garch models in this tutorial. And for Arch, we have agreed that we were going to use two lags, two Arch effects. 
And the second thing that you want to check is going to options and you want to ensure that the backcast parameter is set to 0 0.7. You definitely don't want to put it into one because that's going to be the unconditional, um, unconditional backcast parameter. So we're going to stick it into 0 0.7 and we're going to hit OK. So here we go. Now we have estimated our Arch2 uh, model. We have that the two lags are statistically significant. And here we have, again, the first um, table, this first part, corresponds to the mean equation. And the second part corresponds to the variance equation. The way that you're going to write your model is first the mean equation. We have the Toronto Stock Exchange explained by a constant, the um, outer regressive component and the moving average component. And then we have the variance equation, which is explained by the constant and the two lags that we have included in the, in the arch uh, specification. As we can see, the variance adds up to 0.8. So remember that as a condition, it cannot exceed the unit. So alpha 1 plus alpha 2, they both um, make up to uh, 0.8. The persistence of the volatility is higher the closer it gets uh, to 1. So in this case, 0.8 is relatively close to 1. So we can see then that the persistence of the volatility um, is quite high. So now that we have estimated our ARCH2 model, we have a last step that is taking a look at the model diagnostics. So the first thing will be the heteroscedasticity. And what we need to do is to conduct the ARCH test again. So what we should verify once we conduct the arch test again is that there are no arch effects because otherwise what your model then your result is suggesting you is that your specification is not appropriate, that there still exists heteroscedasticity and that you should be including more arch components. And finally, uh, autocorrelation. We have to look at the correlogram and there should be no significant lags. The, the probability of the Q-test should be bigger than 0 0.05. So remember that the null hypothesis of this Q-test is uh, that the residuals uh, are white noise, yeah? so there is no autocorrelation. So in order to confirm that hypothesis, uh, the p-value has to be bigger than 0 0.05. So let's move into EVUs and let's finish then with the model diagnostics. To finish the model, what we need to do then is to verify that there is no heteroscedasticity uh, still present in this model. So we're going to go into view, receive diagnostics, arch LM test again, and we're going to include the two lags that we have used in our model. And we want to verify now if there's still heteroscedasticity. So as you can see now, the p-value is bigger than 0 0.05. So what we are saying then is that there is no heteroscedasticity present still in this model. So that's a good thing. That's what we wanted. And the last thing is checking for the autocorrelation. The residuals have to be white noise, so I'm going to go into residual diagnostics, correlogram Q statistics, and I'm going to leave the lag specification as default. And as you can see in here in the autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation is that there are no um, significant um, lags. And furthermore, if you can see here in the probability column, Remember that what I mentioned is that the Q, um, the Q test, the null hypothesis is that my residuals are white noise. And because the p-value is bigger than 0 0.05, what we are saying then is that uh, these residuals are white noise. We cannot reject that null hypothesis. So this is very good as well. So this ARCH model, this ARCH2 model satisfies the conditions that we have set for, for ARCH models. And something I would like to mention is that in this column, the probability column, you have values smaller than 0 0.05, then your specification of the arch um, lags is not appropriate. Maybe you need to include more lags. And once you perform again uh, this uh, correlogram, a Q statistic test, you're going to see then that all these values are going to be bigger than 0 0.05. So that's something that you should consider is including more arch effects in the case that this column is telling you that there is autocorrelation. The last thing that I would like to do now is to display the variance of this model. So I'm going to go into PROC and make um, the arch variance series. Um, it's going to tell if you 
um, how do you want to call it? I would like to just call it, of course, conditional variance. Here we have the series then, and we can view the graph of the conditional variance. And here we have it. So what we can do then with this conditional variance is we can plot it along with the Toronto Stock Exchange. I'm going to uh, minimize this. And I'm going to, here I have the, the series that we just generated with the TSX. I'm going to open it as a group. Going to view graph. And I would like to do a last thing that is axis and scaling. And I would like to have the conditional variance on the right scale, uh, axis, sorry. Um, and here we can see that here we have our conditional variance graph and the Toronto Stock Exchange. And we can see how um, the variance has increased significantly in this moment where there is a big drop in the, in the exchange. That's going to be all the material for today. So if you found this video useful, I would like to invite you to subscribe to my channel since I'm going to be submitting many more tutorials about uh, time series analysis. My next video will be about GARCH models. We're going to see how we can estimate GARCH models. So if that's something you're interested about, feel free to subscribe to the channel. And as I mentioned, in the link of the description, you can download the data set for free. And also you can buy the slides in case you're interested in. And also you can get the EBS Word file included in that package. So once again, thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.